Just take a look as we go through though, we were talking about the normal alignment, the normal disc space height, the normal canal width. This is what normal prevertebral soft tissue should look like. You can see the difference between this and the case I just showed you. They should be flat along the anterior surface of the vertebra. Not existent essentially, you know? It, it, it should be a moot point. You, you shouldn't even think about it. Yeah, and then this is the MRI. And I'm showing you a normal MRI here. We won't go through it. Um, actually, I will just really fast. Just because I'm going to show you abnormal MRI in a second, and then Dr. Rizzoli will talk about that as well. So for those of you who weren't here with us before, there are four sequences here on an MRI that we typically get. We get a T1-weighted sequence, which helps us look at bone marrow and helps us look at soft tissues. We get a T2, which shows us the cerebrospinal fluid, which is bright, that is around the spinal cord. It can also show us abnormalities within the spinal cord itself. There are none here. This is normal. This is a different kind of a T2 that takes out all of the um, fat signal in the vertebral body marrow. There's a lot of fat. Um, that highlights any uh, infection or edema, as in trauma, if you saw this before, or cancer in the osseous spine. And this is a post-contrast sequence over here, where if there was an abscess you know, in, the, in the epidural space, in the vertebral bodies, in the discs, in the cord, anywhere, that would show up with intravenous contrast. And this is what an axial T2-weighted image looks like. So just keep that in mind when you look at this. So this was that, that same patient's MRI. And I'll just go through it quickly. Dr. Rizzo already said he was going to do surgery no matter what. This wouldn't make a difference. And I think that's because we had the contrast in the NCT, which showed us the most important parts. So this is the sagittal T1. We've lost our normal uh, vertebral body marrow signal here. We've lost our disc here. Again, I won't go into too much detail since you're not doing radiology yet, probably. Sagittal T2 shows us the cerebrospinal fluid that should be around the spinal cord. At this level, it's all gone. So we know that spinal cord is being compressed by the spine, which is subluxing or vocal kyphosis, as Dr. Rizzoli said. This is that um, T2 sequence I told you takes out all the marrow fat. So it shows the edema in those vertebral bodies. So osteomyelitis. There's actually no abnormal signal in that disc, but it's still disguised. I think it's just all squirted out the front. And then this is the sagittal post-contrast image, which shows not only the enhancement in the infected vertebral bodies, the osteomyelitis, but it shows enhancement in the epidural space in the canal. So that's epidural phlegmon or abscess and pre-vertebral space. So that's all that soft tissue thickening that we saw in the first few images, the x-ray and CT. And here's the axial post-contrast again. This looks almost like, that was a really good CT actually. Usually they're not that good. But it shows the epidural phlegmon pushing, this is the spinal cord back here, pushing it backwards, compressing it. And the pre-vertebral edema, or edema and phlegmon and abscess. Yeah. Wow. And I uh, have a post out picture, but you go ahead if you want to say anything uh, about this before I show that. Look, this, this is like a nightmare. <laughs> this is a nightmare kind of case. This is, a, this is really a disaster. It's really sad, unfortunately, too, because you look at if that, if that x-ray that that patient got was, if they detected the prevertebral soft tissue swelling earlier, and this patient got an MRI or some sort of advanced imaging modality earlier, I guarantee you it would have shown something abnormal, and this patient could have been just started on intravenous antibiotics, and that would have been the end of that. But now you see what happened is this is the natural, this is kind of the natural history of what will happen with untreated infection. Um, so, okay, here is the problem with this patient, okay? You have a huge prevertebral infectious component that's causing significant swelling of the prevertebral soft tissues, okay? Um, you have destruction of vertebral bodies and you have an abscess to this, okay? This is all high up in the cervical spine, all right? And basically all of this stuff needs to come out, all right? So I'm just kind of curious if you guys can, um, so you know, your approach is, before I tell you what I would do for this, for this patient, um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. I, can you guys type it in the chat box? Would you guys do an anterior approach only, posterior approach only, or an anterior and posterior? I'm just curious what you guys think. Wow, if they know that as medical students, I am just so impressed. I need to go back to medical school. Yeah, let's just, let's just see. I, I'm just curious. And it, obviously, like, you know. Actually, there are, there are residents here. There, too. there is a right answer to this, but, uh, but uh, I'm just curious what you guys think. So would you go, if you're going to go anterior, you're going to take out this infection, you're probably going to do corpectomies here, and you're going to um, place, you know, obviously do some sort of inner body here, and then just you're, you're done with your surgery, right? 
if you're going to do posterior, right, you're going to have to probably decompress the lamina posteriorly, instrument, and then you're just going to treat this, your goal then would be treating this with um, antibiotics. Hopefully this stuff will go away, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then if you do anterior and posterior, you're obviously going to do both, right? Okay. I see anterior and a couple of anteriors only. Interesting. Yeah, I, wish I, could vote. I see a couple of anterior and posteriors. Can I vote too? Sir, can you repeat the question again? Yeah. What would be your approach? Anterior only, posterior only, or anterior and posterior? Can we go on? Are you done? Or are you still waiting for answers? I see a couple of, yeah, I see a couple of good answers here. All right. So um, let's. I see anterior and posterior both. Yes. That's, okay. So <laughs> let's, let's talk a little bit about this. So um, Wendy, are you able to draw, um, are you able to draw on the images? I don't know. Am I? You should have a pen. Pen. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Can you draw at the posterior aspect of C2, the posterior vertebral body to the, um, to the, to the lamina, just like a horizontal line, a straight horizontal line from the posterior aspect of C2 to at the, the base lamina. or mid C2. Uh, let's say like somewhere right above the disc. Just like right, here. Yeah, right about On there. The two images out with yes. imaging yes. Exactly. Like and that. Then, perfect. Now can you do the same thing at C7? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. This, the problem is it's not quite midline there, but... Hey, it's okay. Now, can you draw a vertical line through the mm -hmm. midpoint of your top and the midpoint of your bottom line? This is... Oh, oops. Okay. So do you guys know what this is called? What, what we're just showing here? Does anybody know what this is called? I'd be very, very impressed. Not sagittal balance, Mike, but you're thinking along the right lines. Not the plumb line, not the plumb line, but you're, again, you're thinking along the right lines. A plumb line is a, uh, you, you would have to see a, a full length uh, x-ray or full length uh, standing x-ray and that's just a straight horizontal line down. Um, all right, so if you guys heard of the K line, okay? It's a, um, it's a type, this, so this is essentially showing what the K-line is. And this is what we use when we're looking at anterior versus posterior approaches to OPLL, or ossified posterior longitudinal ligament, all right? The same principle can be applied to essentially any sort of ventral pathology, okay? So if the ventral pathology, which you see here, which is the kyphotic deformity, is touching that line, all right, you essentially are committed to doing an anterior approach on this patient. You must, okay? You can't just do a posterior approach only. So you can see it's touching that line, right? It's touching the K-line there. So this patient needs an anterior approach. And here's the problem. This patient's bone is essentially mush, okay? When you get in there, it's gonna be like sponge. When you drill it out and you start you know, doing your work, you don't have good solid bone to get a good solid fusion, right? So you will ultimately, and in, in particular with multi-level corpectomy, which you will have to do on this patient, right? you will have to back this patient up posteriorly. So a patient needs an anterior and posterior approach. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.